Thank you, Madam President. As you know, Madam President, today marks 23 years since the 9-11 terrorist attacks on our nation. Although we are now over two decades removed from one of the greatest tragedies in our nation's history, the memories remain in our mind as if it had just happened yesterday. Those horrific events in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Shanksville, Pennsylvania forever changed national security in the United States of America. It also changed many of our families, our fellow Americans' families. Our nation bound, banded together, and we supported one another, and we rebuilt and recovered. But we will never forget. Many of us were here on that day. I was here in Washington, D.C., in my office building on the House side. I certainly will never forget that awful and tragic day. Madam President, I rise today to talk about another topic, or a few topics for that matter, and that is the many issues that I heard from my constituents back home during my visits across West Virginia, from Weirton to Morgantown to Parsons to Ranson to Huntington and all other points in between in West Virginia. As you and many of our colleagues did, I spent the last five weeks traveling every corner of my state, touring businesses, celebrating wins for our state, and meeting with local leaders, business owners, and constituents. But most importantly, this was a time for me to hear about the issues that are directly impacting them, the solutions that are working for them, and also the challenges that they face. And I heard a lot, but the common themes I heard over and over again, number one, inflation, the border crisis, crime across our country, the chaos that we are witnessing abroad and our country's weakness on the world stage, Workforce shortages, I heard that everywhere I went. And the inadequacy of permitting, we're an energy state. And the concerns, many concerns in our agriculture communities. Many West Virginians I spoke with feel that the current administration's agenda is just not working for them. And I can see why. So let's take a look at this. Well, we can start with what's top of mind for folks all across the country and that is the rising cost of goods and services. Every day, men and women go to work, take their kids to school, expecting the predictability that filling up their car will cost a certain amount, that their trip to the grocery store will be in the same range. But what do they find? Well, thanks to inflation fueled in part by excessive government spending to the tune of trillions of dollars, because of this administration, Americans are, pay, are paying higher prices for many things that they cannot do without. West Virginians are spending an average of $880 more a month on food, shelter, and energy prices than they were before the Biden-Harris administration began. Over the past year, consumer prices have risen 3%. percent We go, oh, that's not so much. But over the last, since 2021, they have increased over 20% between the time President Biden and Vice President Harris came into office. So if you're saving up now to buy a new or a used car and you keep saving, you gotta keep saving because it, it just costs more. Headed out to the grocery store, prepare to see a larger number at the bottom of your receipt thanks to this administration. West Virginians are spending an average of $103 more per month on food. Making your monthly rent payment or your mortgage payment, if it seems to be higher than it was last year, that's because it is. The national media rent, median rent is up 22% since President Biden and Vice President Harris took office. To add to that, mortgage rates have skyrocketed. Over, uh, overall, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is at an average of almost 6.5%. In my state, the average is 6.6%. They were in the upper twos, early threes, just a year ago. Small businesses are suffering. For example, the construction industry is very busy in West Virginia. More companies and people want to come to our state. The high cost of operating businesses 
already, with already slim margins is, is much, much higher. Contractors working under constraints of already very slim margins are acutely feeling these failed economic policies. They're paying for more goods and services. They're putting more gas into their tank. They're having to wait longer and longer because the supply chain is disrupted. The numbers just don't lie, and I heard it frequently all around the state, that the savings many people have worked so hard for, whether they want to save up for a vacation, save up for a, a bigger and better place to live, or to afford to send their children to college, that the savings that they worked hard for, that they sacrificed to accumulate, are dwindling right in front of their eyes due to the skyrocketing costs of living during the last three and a half years. Another issue I heard about is the workforce shortage. When I attended the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce Business Summit, this topic came up again and again and again, but also particularly for one of my manufacturers in the southern part of my state. Specifically, this manufacturer was trying to set up an apprenticeship program so they could have a uh, pipeline of a workforce, start with high school uh, seniors, put them in the apprenticeship program, and then they would come and work at the manufacturer. Specifically, they'd been trying to set this up, but the De U.S. Department of Labor, under this Biden-Harris administration, threw a wrench in their plans and slowed the process down. The bureaucracy that the company has faced during the process hindered their ability to follow through with this apprenticeship program. The 21st century economy requires innovative approaches to workforce development and education, and apprenticeships are one way to do that, but you have to do it the way the administration wants. You can't tailor it for your own, not just business, but also where do you live had, had, would demand different kinds of apprenticeship opportunities. They can help, uh, businesses can help advance job training and employment opportunities or something that I think I would be very supportive of to try to keep that workforce uh, busy, not just busy, but also increasing their capabilities. There are policies to employ and regulations to cut that would improve our economic standing. But instead, the economic policies of the Biden-Harris administration have severely jeopardized the American dream for millions of Americans. The border crisis is another issue that came up repeatedly during my visits back home. You might ask yourself, well, West Virginia isn't a border state, so why do West Virginians really care about the crisis at the southern border? West Virginians care about this because it impacts directly into our state and, and into other, uh, beyond other border states. Under the Biden-Harris administration, every state is a border state. So let's take the opioid crisis as an example. Deadly drugs, fentanyl in particular, continue to flow across our southern border, making their way into our communities. The overdose crisis has taken thousands of lives of sons and daughters, mothers and fathers. And as someone who represents a state that is one of the hardest hit states, I have begged begged the Biden-Harris administration to do something different, or better yet, just do something to stop this. But they have proven from day one that they have no genuine interest in closing our southern border or closing down the trafficking of all of the drugs. When you have all these people, you have to devote your manpower to the people that are coming across and the drugs slip in. Crime's another topic that came up frequently during my travels. West Virginians can see what's happening across our country, and it's no wonder they're alarmed. Democrats have ch championed a soft-on-crime agenda that has contributed to some soaring crime rates. According to the Major Cities Chiefs uh, Association, when compared to mid-year 2019 pre-pandemic levels, homicides are up nearly 26% and aggravated assaults are up 23% in the United States. This is not just acceptable, it's terrifying. We, we see it here in the city streets of, of Washington. Repeated calls from the Democrats to defund the police for open borders, defund ICE, and reduced sentencing or bail requirements has led to a crime increase so overwhelming 
that Americans fear regarding crime in their communities is at an all-time 50-year high. They're afraid. We're afraid. Though President Biden and Vice President Harris build responsibility here, in many ways, they're following the direction of their party. We've seen a lack of leadership from the White House and an overly politicized Department of Justice and district attorneys who refuse to prosecute crimes. The Biden administration has insisted on nominating radical, soft on crime advocates to our federal judgeships. And with this utter disregard for law and order is concerning, it's just another trend for this administration. Then there's the chaos unfolding around the world. A constituent recently told me, and I quote, it's now obvious on the world stage, especially to our enemies, that we have an extremely weak commander in chief for the first time in my life, and I'm 74 years old. I don't go to bed feeling that I will be sure when I wake up in the morning, that I will be safe when I wake up in the morning. The indecision and ill-advised policies of the Biden-Harris administration have, have signaled unreliability to our allies and weakness to those who would do a harm. We are living in a time when our nation faces the most dangerous global threats that we have in decades. But there's been wavering support during these tumultuous times from this administration. Whether it's the display of weakness on our withdrawal from Afghanistan, or how the Biden-Harris administration has basically slow walked the ability for Ukraine to actually maximize the help that we've given them and other nations have given them to be able to stop the Russians, or whether it's Iran is giving its militias weapons to attack our troops, resulting in the deaths of three Army soldiers in Jordan and injuries to dozen more. The response, the administration is so afraid of escalation that they only authorize minimal responses. And in the Middle East, that doesn't work. So now we see that uh, uh, what's going on in Israel and that the administration is acting as if Israel's the problem. They forget about October the 7th. We've been absolutely clear-eyed that there's mor no moral equiv equivalency between Hamas and Israel in this world and it shouldn't be hard to say. Another issue I heard about, and I mentioned it in the beginning, is agriculture. Um, we're very concerned, our agriculture uh, communities are very concerned about uh, our inability to pass a farm bill. Why is the leadership in this uh, majority here in the Senate not helping our farmers get the relief they need? West Virginia farmers depend on the farm, farm bill as they do farms all over the country and the stability of a five-year reauthorization. We did one one-year extension. It looks like we're going to do another one. And this just really sends the wrong signals to a huge sector, but also a food security sector for our country. Senator Bozeman from Arkansas has been traveling the country, listening to farmers all over, in the ag community all over uh, the country. I'm glad he came to West Virginia to hear but our farmers are worried about dumping of products from other countries and their ability as smaller farms to be able to, um, to exist. So we did have some positives that went on over the last several uh, years, or the last several months in August. I traveled to, uh, met with the mayors in Charlestown and Harpers Ferry about some of their funding needs and wastewater, dedicated the new Heritage Center in Wheeling and then received updates on a major water system in Weirton. These are just a few examples of where I listened to their needs and was able to help them through congressional directed spending solve some of their problems. Um, there are certainly concerns on folks' minds, and it, but exciting things are happening in our state and the spirit was powerfully felt at the business summit. I was very pleased to bring the Canadian ambassador as my guest to talk about the over $2 billion of West Virginia products that Canada buys and how trade is so very important. I went to see where we're going to complete Quarter H, hopefully, and fix that Market Street, Street Bridge in the Northern Panhandle. But, you know, I was really pleased to go to uh, Marshall University and see their cybersecurity program. They're, in, they're bringing up an Institute of Cybersecurity for Critical Infrastructure, and I was honored to bring the CISA director, Jen Easterly, to, to Huntington to see the potential for not just 
our security, but also for the workforce this is going to be providing the cybersecurity. So I had productive visitors, visits in our states. Always great to be out and be around and talk with folks. I talk with length about with people individually or as a group. Um, regardless, uh, Americans want us to do our jobs. They don't want us to do show votes. They don't want us to sit around and nominate people. They want us to get our government spending done, our national defense authorization, our farm bill, all these things on our plate. And yet we're sitting around wasting time doing votes that really don't have as big an impact on individuals as many of the things that we should be doing. It doesn't have to be this way. Americans shouldn't be forced to choose between paying rent, paying food for food, or filling up their gas tank. They shouldn't turn on the TV and see our southern border in chaos and our cities uh, flooded with crime. And they shouldn't have to harbor such doubt about our international standing. So we can do this better. We can do this better, and we should. With that, I yield back.